I think we are, yeah, we're all together now. I think we're ready to start. So this would be a, this would be a good night to have a, a lesson on baptism or Noah or something. Um, we are in Matthew 23. We are about to talk about the, uh, the woes to the scribes and Pharisees. Matthew 23, we'll begin in verse 13. Now, on Sunday I gave us a little preview of where we needed to start with uh, on this, and I asked you to see what your translation had in verse 14. And for a lot of us, that, that's kind of a trick prompt, <laughs> because a lot of our translations do not have verse 14. Um, and I wanted to, you know, before we get into the woes against the scribes and Pharisees, I wanted to consider this because, uh, mainly because it is a big textual difference between the King James uh, slash New King James and some of our other English translations. Um, and, you know, every once in a while it goes around where, um, you know, people will talk about the you know, missing verses that have been stolen out of the Bible, that kind of thing, that usually accompanies some kind of conspiracy theory about uh, people changing things to pull the wool over people's eyes. Um, and this particular one is kind of an odd circumstance. Um, so we also need to cover it because it also affects the number of woes that we're covering. So the real question is, how many woes are there against the scribes and the Pharisees? If you're reading out of the King James and New King James, there are eight woes against the scribes and Pharisees. If you're reading uh, basically every other English translation, um, it's seven woes. Um, so now, if you are reading the King James or the New King James, verse 14 reads, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Uh, and before we go any further with this, uh, I want to note that there are two parallels to this. In Luke, this is Luke chapter 20, verse 47. And in Mark, it's Mark 12, verse 40. You find Jesus making the same accusation against the scribes and Pharisees in roughly the same historical circumstance. Right? He's at the temple, and it's on the tail end of the temple controversies, which is probably how uh, a scribe at some point later down the line uh, ended up taking that accusation from Mark or Luke and putting it into Matthew. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, one thing we should note, though, is that in Luke's account of things, uh, that takes place separately to the woes against the scribes and Pharisees. In Luke, the woes take place uh, beginning in uh, Luke 11, verse 37. So entirely different context where Jesus delivers the woes there. He's dining with a Pharisee. Um, so in, in Luke's telling of it, these are, these are separate things. Um, now, we suspect that at some point, a, uh, a scribe has taken the content of Luke 20, verse 47, or Mark 12, verse 40, and put it in this spot where it seemed to fit to them. Uh, and that is because our modern English translations... Um, Remember, they, they are translated off of the oldest and most complete Greek manuscripts that we have available to us now. Um, the King James was translated off of a much later and much more limited set of Greek manuscripts. Um, but in all of our oldest copies of Matthew, the text just moves directly from verse 13 to verse 15, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, we'll see in just a, a minute uh, as we study the text itself. Verse 13 and verse 15 really go together. 
uh, they they make very similar accusations against the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, now, what makes this circumstance weird and different is that usually, you know, usually whenever we have differences like this, it comes down to, all right, what do the oldest manuscripts say versus what do the majority of manuscripts say? Because usually the King James matches, uh, like if, if you took all of the Greek copies of the New Testament that have been recorded over the last 2,000 years and just did, you know, a comparison, what do the majority of them say? Usually the King James matches that uh, where there's a difference. This is one of the rare cases where it doesn't. Um, in the majority of Greek manuscripts, they do include the content of verse 14 about uh, for a you know, pretense making long prayers and devouring widows' houses, but they put that material before verse 13. So in between what we are reading in our Bibles is verses uh, 12 and 13. They make it the first woe against the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, and then verses 13 and 15 still go together. The King James in this instance, is reflecting a Greek text that only exists in, a, in roughly half a dozen manuscripts, late manuscripts. And we're talking, a, again, a, out of a pool of thousands and thousands of Greek manuscripts, only about a half dozen of them present the text in the order that the King James has it. Um, so it is kind of a, a messy situation. Um, but wait, one thing that I want us to note here is that um, I mean, a lot of people will turn to things like this and present it either as some kind of conspiracy or as an assault on the idea that the scriptures are inspired. And one thing that I want us to consider that even in this very messy situation that we have, and we're just kind of scratching the surface of it because really I want to get back to Matthew, uh, but even in this very messy manuscript situation, the result is ultimately not a change in doctrine. Like if we were to ask ourselves, all right, did Jesus teach that the scribes and Pharisees devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. Well, the, even, regardless of any of this, the definitive answer is yes, he did teach that. You can go to Mark or Luke. He absolutely did teach that. And, and this is generally the way that these kinds of differences between our English translations play out. Some people really like to make hay over these things like they are a really, really big deal. But whenever you actually look at what kinds of differences actually take place between some of these manuscripts, uh, you'll find that they're, they, just, they are very, very minor. Um, don't make any kind of change to doctrine. And what they reflect is a couple of things. First off, that uninspired human beings, you know, the, the copyists and scribes who are responsible for uh, copying the text and transmitting it generation to generation, were very good at what they did. They're still not inspired. They're human. Sometimes they make mistakes. But God has continued to be with his word so that despite thousands of years of transmission of this same text down through many, many generations, and despite those copyists uh, being not inspired themselves, despite all of that, the word that we have in front of us is, is not different uh, from what you could see. I mean, you, if you just picked out just a random Greek copy of some book of the New Testament from, you know, say you grab one from, from 400 A.D. Say you grab one from 900 A.D. 
Say you grab one from 1200 AD. Say you grab one from Egypt. Say you grab one from France. Say you grab one from Germany. You're not going to find that you're looking at different Bibles. Uh, that the word has been transmitted to us faithfully over the course of these generations. Um, so, and if you, if you want to do any extra reading on this particular situation uh, with Matthew 23, 14, I can point you to an article that is, it's a little technical, but it, it gives a brief overview of how the King James ended up the way that it did with its text. Um, but with that aside, I do want us to go ahead and get into the text itself. And moving forward, uh, since we've been doing our study out of the ESV, uh, which does not contain verse 14, we're going to be talking about seven woes against the scribes and the Pharisees. And again, I, th I think that fits Matthew. Matthew likes to use biblically significant numbers, like three and seven. Um, and so I think seven woes to the scribes and Pharisees best fits what we've seen from Matthew so far. Uh, let's go ahead and read the text, and then we'll pray together. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. And woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he's bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. Whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of, within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Well, thus you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel down to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. 
Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with our time together this evening to study your word. We pray, Father, that you open our hearts and minds. Help us to understand your will. Help us, Father, uh, to be consistent uh, in the way that we act, that, that we practice what we preach, that we obey your word, and that we teach your word faithfully, that we encourage one another uh, into obedience in your word. We thank you, Father, for the teaching of your Son. We thank you for the gift of his blood that cleanses us from our sins. We thank you for the hope of the resurrection. And we thank you, Father, uh, for his intercession for us. He has ascended and is at your right hand, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. We pray, Father, that you will hasten his coming. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Excuse me. Okay, so. As we consider these woes to the scribes and Pharisees, uh, we're going to consider them mostly in pairs. Um, we've got three pairs of woes. And then the seventh woe, uh, which uh, sun, uh, sums things up and levies uh, the, the harshest accusation against them. So the first two woes, verses 13 through fi and 15, are about how Pharisees and scribes keep others out of the kingdom. Uh, the third and fourth woes, Verses 16 through 24 are about, uh, they are about how the Pharisees twist the law of Moses. Woes 5 and 6, it's verses 25 through 28, are about how the scribes and Pharisees are rotten on the inside. And then the final woe, uh, verses 29 through 33, are about how the Pharisees are the sons of those who murdered the prophets and what that means uh, for them. So the first pair of woes condemns the Pharisees for keeping people out of the kingdom. And they do it in a couple of different ways. Now, first off, well, if you look at verse 13, all right, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You know, it's like they've barred entry. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. But we should recall back in chapter 16, whenever Peter made the great confession, remember what Jesus gave to Peter? Besides, I mean, besides the name Peter. He said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Right? The idea is that Peter's job and the job of the other apostles with him, is to open the way into the kingdom. And that's what we find them doing in the book of Acts. Right, the disciples' task would be letting people in and getting people in. And, and this is something that we'll see repeated in the final passage of the book, you know, the, great, the Great Commission. But the Pharisees shut and bar the door into the kingdom, actively discouraging people from acknowledging Jesus as the Christ. And this is something that will continue to happen over the course of the first century. Right, we'll see the Pharisees and the disciples opposed to each other. We see that over the course of Acts. The Pharisees seek to thwart the work of the disciples. Uh, and that's ultimately a big part of how Paul ends up imprisoned, is the Pharisees seeking to keep people out of the kingdom. So that's, that's one thing that they do. Is anybody who's interested uh, or, uh, in following Jesus as the Messiah, the Pharisees try to cut them off, try to block them, dissuade them from acknowledging who Jesus is. The other way that they keep people out of the kingdom uh, is by trying to get other people to follow them instead. Right? You 
travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. All right, but what happens to this proselyte, the one who follows the, the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees? You make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. So their missionary work, of, of course, doesn't create people who are obeying the law because the people who have obeyed the law will end up following Jesus. Instead, their missionary work, their proselytizing, uh, proselytizing uh, ends up creating people who are just like them. People who ignore what God says, who don't practice what they preach, who lay out stumbling blocks, people who are hypocrites. Uh, any questions or comments on these first two woes against the scribes and Pharisees? Wayne. Um, just uh, uh, more or less a question, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. As they're making these proselytes, okay, mm -hmm. he may be looking backwards, but in when, from what I've been taught, he's mm -hmm. also looking forwards. Yes. In I that, so. from this point on, from the point where Jesus sets up his kingdom onward. Uh, the quote-unquote Jews will no longer be recognized as quote-unquote Jews. In other words, true Israelites, because now it's going to go from Israel, the physical country, to now be in the spiritual country, the true Israel, mm -hmm. the sons of Abraham, who we are. Yeah. So the Jews that they are making, that the Jews the physical Jews are making will right. n never be accounted as uh, true Jews any, any more after this. It's yeah, that, to, to put it in Paul's terms, and, and Paul kind of, so Paul talks kind of on both sides of that. Um, in one place in Romans, uh, he says that, you know, not all Israel is Israel, right? It, 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 he says it's not the the outward Jew that counts, but the inward Jew. Those are his words, I think, in, in Romans 2. But then later on, um, in talking about Israel in like chapters 9, 10, and 11, he still refers to them as Israel. It's just that they are, they're Israel as we usually see them in the Old Testament. They've gone astray. They've not followed what God has set in front of them, uh, just in the worst way possible, because they've rejected the Messiah. They've rejected the Son of God. Uh, and yes, the, the condemnation falls on them, working in both of those directions. Right? The, the Pharisees stood condemned already because they were already twisting the law. In fact, the next couple of, uh, of woes will get to that. Um, and any proselytes they made, that's, that's what they're teaching them into, is this is the way we handle the law. This is the way that we, uh, the way that we worship God. But this also does look forward because, yeah, they're going to continue to teach um, not only their fellow Israelites, but also any Gentiles that they can persuade not to confess Jesus as Christ. So good. Yeah, that we have that uh, that the church it represents. Uh, the, the Israel of God and that we've been grafted into the promises given to Israel um, and that any who reject Jesus as the Messiah are, are errant. Right? They, they are in error. So, good. Uh, any other questions or comments on these first two woes? Okay. Uh, let's see. So let's consider the third and fourth woes. The longest section in this, uh, and it condemns the scribes and the Pharisees for twisting the law of Moses. So first off, they they teach a form of sophistry when it comes to keeping vows and oaths. 
If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. All right, what they're doing is they're, they're splitting hairs when it comes to which oaths are binding and which ones are not. Uh, it is, it's wholly arbitrary what they are doing. There's no basis for it in the scriptures. Um, or in terms of the fourth woe, they are straining at gnats and swallowing camels. So Jesus rejects any such distinctions between, all right, here's, here's an oath that doesn't really count, and here's an oath that really does count. He says that if you say you're going to do something for the Lord, then you ought to do it. You're bound to do it. All right, or in the terms of the Sermon on the Mount, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And remember, in that context, even there, Jesus is not just teaching about generic honesty, but specifically about following through on our commitments to God. Then he rejects the distinction there, too. If you say you're going to do something, do it. So the Pharisees, not only do they behave this way, they also teach others to behave this way, right? This is, this is one of the ways in which they make their price, uh, proselytes twice as much sons of hell as they are. Uh, because, if the, again, it's not just what they do. The woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it's nothing. Right? They've, they've got people coming to them asking how to rightly live under the law. And here you have them engaged in just false teaching. They also twist the law by neglecting what Jesus calls the weightier matters. Justice and mercy and faith. Right, they take care of some of the downstream commandments, tithing, you know, mint and dill and cumin, but they're not keeping the greatest commands to love God and to love their neighbor as their self. And notice here the, the distinction isn't just between like a physical worldly principle versus a, a material principle, or, or, or rather a spiritual principle, uh, because love God and love neighbor, those aren't just spiritual principles. Right? Those, those have material applications to them. Like under the law, um, if you were loving your neighbor as yourself, you were doing things like uh, not bearing false witness, not coveting, not uh, you know committing adultery with your neighbor's wife, not stealing his stuff. Um, you know, if if one of your neighbors. Um, is, is poor and in need of aid, you're supposed to help him out. Not supposed to charge interest. Right? If, if the guy ends up going into debt slavery, you're supposed to release him on the seventh year. Right? That's, that's all very concrete stuff. But it's like, that's, so how do, you, how do you prove that you love your neighbor? Well, it's through what you do. Right? How do you prove that you love God? You worship him. Right? That's a concrete thing. We've, we've all gathered together in this one space to worship God. And this is a sign that we love God. All right? You don't take his name in vain. All right? You pray to him, all of these things. All right? But some of these things, again, justice, mercy, faith, the Pharisees are neglecting. They're, they're essentially taking the salad bar view of the law. Right? There's certain things they want to keep and other things that they don't particularly care to keep. Because justice and mercy and faith in, in real actual practice tend to be a lot harder than tithing. Right? Like how hard is it to tithe mint and dill and cumin? It's not all that hard, right? You get your scale out, and you measure out ten parts, and you separate the tenth part and give it to the priests, give it to God. 
That's easy. Anybody can weigh stuff on a scale. But actually treating their neighbors right and treating God right is harder. Uh, any questions or comments about the third and fourth woes? I think most of these are fairly straightforward. All right, the fifth and sixth woes. Condemn the Pharisees as being attractive on the outside, or they look righteous on the outside, but they're rotten on the inside. And Jesus has taught on this quite a lot during his ministry. Here you go back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Or again in chapter 12, verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good. The evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil. Or again in Matthew 15, verse 11, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Right? And this is, so the Pharisees, they are guilty of being rotten on the inside where it really counts. Right? Their treasure is evil. But they appear to be righteous on the outside. And this is the essence of hypocrisy. That again, they, they appear one way, but they are actually another way. And notice what Jesus accuses them of. That within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Think of who these guys were. Like, what's their whole their whole reason for being. They are teachers of the law. That's like their whole thing. But Jesus tells them they're actually lawless. These teachers of the law are themselves lawless. Their whole reason for being is brought to nothing because of their disobedience, their refusal to obey God. Uh, any questions or comments on the, the fifth and sixth woes? I know we're running through these kind of quick, but that's fine. So Jesus ended the sixth woe with the image of a whitewashed tomb. And that image of the tomb carries us forward into the seventh woe, where Jesus accuses the Pharisees of building the tombs of the prophets uh, and decorating the monuments of the righteous, but being themselves the sons of those who murdered the prophets. And this woe is probably the most complex of the seven um, because it relies on a lot of different things at once. First, it relies on the way that Israelites historically associated themselves with their fathers. We remember from our Old Testament studies just how frequently that phrase is used, my father's house. Um, or whenever a count was made or orders were issued, it was all done through father's houses. And it's on the basis of this association that Jesus connects the scribes and the Pharisees to the murder of the prophets. And it, it might not make intuitive sense to us. How is Jesus drawing this accusation against the scribes and the Pharisees based on something that their ancestors did? Because um, we, we really don't think about family association the same way that Israel did. Uh, really the closest that we have to that kind of thinking is the, the modern saying, like father, like son. Or, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. 
Um, and even that, it doesn't quite match the way that Israelites tended to draw associations between themselves and their family. Um, you know, between the father's house and the sons of that house. Uh, but again, it's, it's probably as close as we get in our own modern context. The, the association that they would have drawn is stronger and more concrete than the one that we draw with that saying, like father, like son. Um, anyway, we might think of another interaction that Jesus has elsewhere with the Pharisees in John 8. Um, because remember, they claim to be sons of Abraham. And it's on the basis of their, uh, their descent from Abraham that they claim to be righteous people. And Jesus, he doesn't, he doesn't throw that whole mode of thinking away. He just says, actually, your father isn't who you think it is. You're not actually sons of Abraham. You're sons of the devil. <laughs> and you are like the devil, your father. Or he uses, in fact, the same logic there um, as he's using here. So, you know, again, if somebody in our, our modern Western context tried making the argument that Jesus makes here, we would probably object. Like, well, that's, not, that's not literally true. How can he be blaming this person for something that their ancestors generations ago did? Um, because... The scribes and the Pharisees, I mean, they didn't literally murder any of the prophets who were martyred in the Old Testament, but they are the sons of those who murdered the prophets, which in this day and age, in Jesus' context, suggests enough of an association that it serves as you know, the jumping off point for what else Jesus has to say to them. So the next step in this woe relies on foreknowledge. All right, so he's established, you guys are the sons of, the pro of those who murdered the prophets. He then says in verse 32, fill up then the measure of your fathers. So Jesus is speaking here not to something that the scribes and Pharisees have already done, but to something which they are about to do, which obviously, what is that? What are they about to do? They're about to kill Jesus. They're about to have Jesus murdered. But more than that, even, right? It's, it's not just that one act that they're going to take. He says, later, therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify. And some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. And we have the record of this in the book of Acts. So Jesus is addressing them here with a sarcastic commandment. All right, fill up then the measure of your fathers. And this is something, appropriately, this is a, uh, something typical of the prophets. This is the way the prophets spoke to Israel. So, for example, in Jeremiah 7, 21, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Add to your burnt offerings, sorry, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices. Eat the flesh. Right, but the, the whole point of that in Jeremiah 7 is that it doesn't matter. Their sacrifices don't count uh, because they're a bunch of wicked men and they're going to be destroyed. Or Amos 4, 4, Come to Bethel and transgress to Gilgal and multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them, for so you love to do, O people of Israel, declares the Lord God. All right, now, does, is God actually literally commanding them, go sin? Is it the will of God that they should go sin? No, this is, he's being sarcastic here in the sense of he's convicting them of their sin. It's almost like he's, he's daring them to sin in a way that is designed to discourage them from sinning. 
right? Like, go ahead and do that. See how that turns out for you. See what happens. He is not actually telling them to do that. Uh, the same here. Jesus is addressing them the way the prophets would have addressed them. The very prophets whom their fathers murdered, and who it turns out they will murder. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. Go ahead, do it. See what happens. See if you are really as righteous as you think you are. And what's going to turn out is that they will, because they have the same attitude as their fathers. And this leads us into their hypocrisy. So we know how their fathers treated the prophets. We know how they are going to treat the prophets. But how do they treat the prophets whom their fathers killed? Well, you go back to the beginning of the woe. You build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Right? The scribes and the Pharisees honor the prophets when they're dead and can't speak to them. But when they are confronted with living prophets who declare to them the oracles of God, well, what do they do? Well, they murder them just like their fathers did. And in that way, they are hypocrites because they celebrate the very people that they themselves would have put to death if given the opportunity. Right? When they're saying, well, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets, they're fooling themselves. They're lying to themselves about themselves. They don't know who they are. But it's going to be proven to them in their near future. All right, any, uh, any questions or comments on that seventh woe before we wrap up? Ginger. Um, I think... Um, I, I think that there's a really um, a really personal application for us with that seventh woe because I can't tell you how many times I've heard people talk about like, oh, you know, the Israelites were so foolish and they did this uh, and we would never do that. The Jews so who killed better. Jesus were so awful and we would never do that. Mm -hmm. And just like the scribes and the Pharisees, their fathers killed the prophets, the scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus' day are our spiritual forefathers. They are just as lost as we are. They are if just they act, as foolish as we are. Did, yeah. yeah, and so we have to maintain the same humility that Jesus calls them to and realize we are human, we can make the same mistakes, and we need to not um, turn up our nose at that example. Yes, yeah, that the, the rotten heart of the Pharisee can live inside us if we are not attentive, if we're not constantly fighting against it and submitting ourselves to God. And if we have that same heart in us, uh, then yeah, we'll end up behaving the same way, right? Remember, out of, out of a person's treasure, he speaks. Um, and so we have to take care that we don't, and, and it's, you know, it's not just like, you know, looking back on the scripture, and this is something that we tend to do, by the way. We will look back on the scriptures and say, yeah, look at these people. They're so, they're so dumb. They're so wicked. We would definitely know better. We wouldn't do that. Um, but we also do the, the flip side of it, too, that Jesus talks about, right? Building the tombs of the prophets, decorating the monuments of the righteous, you know, we, we will talk up the, the righteous examples of holy men and women. Right? We'll speak with admiration of the Apostle Paul. And what, you know, one thing, I would love to see what would happen. Like this, is, this would be a big test for a church. What would a church do if actually confronted with the Apostle Paul himself? If the Apostle Paul rolled in, and we didn't know who he was, and he got up in the pulpit and spoke, how would we receive it? 
Would we accept his words or would we treat him the way that like the Corinthians treated him? <laughs> so excellent. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, we are we're actually a couple minutes over time, so we will finish there. And Lord willing, on uh, Sunday, we will close up Matthew 23. Uh, because Jesus is going to extend these condemnations out, not just to the scribes and Pharisees, but to all Jerusalem. And we're going to see that what he has had to say about the scribes and Pharisees doesn't just apply to them, but applies at the very least to the people of Jerusalem, and I think arguably to Israel as a whole. All right, thank you so much for your questions and comments and your kind attention this evening.